Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I, re I remembered to answer two questions that uh, someone had asked before. You had asked about how does West Nile get transmitted between birds? And I asked Dixon de Pommier, who's the uh, expert, and he said birds are very social and they, they have virus and saliva. So that's how it goes from bird to bird. He said they've done experiments where they'll put birds in a closed room and they'll put some infected birds and some uninfected and they readily transmit it. Okay, so that was one. The other question, someone asked me, is it true that they put shrimp in the water to get rid of the mosquitoes so they don't transmit diseases? And I asked Dixon de Pommier also, and he said shrimp don't eat mosquitoes. They're vegetarians. All right, so the answer to that, whoever asked me that, I don't remember. So you don't put shrimp in water to get rid of mosquitoes. All right, today we're going to talk about transformation and oncogenesis. Now, oncogenesis is the development of cancer, all right? It means you get a malignant tumor that is something that, whose growth is not restricted. It infiltrates into surrounding tissues and replaces normal cells. That's oncogenesis. Cancer is a genetic disease. After 90 plus years of research, we have finally learned this. And in the genetics of cancer, there are permutations that affect the way cells communicate, the way they grow, the way they proliferate, many other things as well, the way they uh, induce the formation of blood vessels. Some of the mutations are inherited that cause cancer. Some are caused by DNA damage, environmental carcinogens, and infectious agents, which is what we're going to talk about today, viruses, virus-induced cancers. About 20% of human cancers viruses are contributing factors and here are your viruses you have a uh, power supply yes thank you excellent thank you and here are the seven viruses that participate in human cancers Epstein-Barr virus hepatitis B virus Hepatitis C virus, HTLV1, human papillomaviruses, human herpes virus 8, and Merkel cell polyomavirus, the latest addition to this list. So these viruses have specific mechanisms by which they induce cancers. Notice HIV isn't on here. It doesn't, it doesn't specifically induce cancers the way we're going to talk about today. It makes cells proliferate because your immune response makes cytokines that do that and when cells proliferate they accumulate mutations okay. so uh, viruses are major causes of liver cancer and cervical cancer now the point here to remember is that when viruses cause tumors they don't need to do that to replicate it's an accident as you'll see by the end here it's a side effects of the host response to infection so here are some other these are all the known oncogenic viruses uh, which not only cause tumors in humans but other animals as well. So we have hepatitis C viruses, the retroviruses, also human. These are, of course, both uh, causing tumors in humans. And then a variety of DNA viruses also causing tumors in various species. Adenoviruses, hepadna, herpes, papilloma, polyoma, and even the pox viruses causing myxomas and fibromas types of tumors uh, in animals. It all begins in uh, 1909 when Peyton Rouse got an English hen from a farmer in New Jersey that had a tumor on it. He took out the tumor, he ground it up, made a cell-free filtrate. This is 1909, where we already know about viruses passing through filters. And he injected the filtrate into another chicken, and that chicken developed the same type of tumor. Do you know where this work was done, by the way? It's right down the street at Rockefeller, which at the time was Rockefeller Medical Institute. Okay? So he showed that cancer could be caused by a viral infection. It took 50 years before this was appreciated. In the intervening time, people were looking for all other sorts of causes of cancer. But he eventually got the Nobel Prize for this 50, over 50 years later, in 1966. So his legacy is Rouse sarcoma virus, which as you will see, uh, gives rise to two more Nobel Prizes in this story. Now, if you're interested in cancer, I recommend you read this book. 
just came out. It's called The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who is an oncologist up at Columbia. Really beautifully written book. And I'm going to give you three paragraphs from this book to show you how good it is, and also because it says some of the stuff better than I do. By the 1950s, cancer researchers had split into three feuding camps. The virologists, led by Peyton Rouse, claimed that viruses cause cancer, although no such virus had been found in human studies. Epidemiologists argued that exogenous chemicals cause cancer, although they could not offer a mechanistic explanation. The third camp possessed weak circumstantial evidence that genes internal to the cell might cause cancer. And they will turn out to be right in this story. In 1951, a young virologist named Howard Temin arrived at Caltech to study the genetics of fruit flies. Restless and imaginative, he soon grew bored with fruit flies. Switching fields, he chose to study Rouse sarcoma virus in Renato Dubeco's laboratory. So here's Howard Temin, and here's Renato Dubeco, who we've talked about already for developing a plaque assay for animal viruses. Until the late 50s, Rouse sarcoma virus had been shown to cause tumors only in live chickens. Remember, starting from that first experiment of Peyton Rouse. Temin imagined creating cancer in a petri dish. In 1958, in his seventh year in Dulbeco's lab, Temin succeeded. He added Rouse sarcoma virus to a layer of normal cells in a petri dish. The infection of the cells incited them to grow uncontrollably, forcing them to form tiny distorted heaps containing hundreds of cells that Temin called foci. The foci, Temin reasoned, represented cancer distilled into its essential elemental form, cells growing uncontrollably, unstoppably, pathological mitosis. So this is the kind of nice writing he does. He goes through the whole history of cancer from the beginning to the present. So these are the foci that Temin saw of cells. Again, these are cells in culture. He infected them with Rouse sarcoma virus. These happen to be avian cells but the virus will transform other cells as well. Here's the focus right here. You can see the monolayer around it is normal, and these cells are elongated. They will pile up. You can, you can have round foci as well, such as this one. So he said this is what the virus is doing, and it's analogous to what it does in an animal to make cells divide uncontrollably. By the 1960s, this property was ascribed to other viruses as well, besides Rouse. So, uh, in 1962, polyomavirus was shown to cause transformation of, of baby hamster kidney cells. In 1964, SV40 was shown to transform a mouse cell line. In these experiments, most of the cells died, but rare ones who didn't die, which didn't die, had different properties. They were transformed. That's where the word transformation come. They were transformed into something different. So the transformation property includes the la loss of anchorage, dependence. They don't need a surface for attachment. They will pile up and even grow in, the, in suspension. They lose contact inhibition. They don't stop growing when they touch each other as normal cells do. They pile up and they form these foci, which is what Temin first saw. In semi-solid media, so if you put, if you resuspend the cells in an agar containing medium, such as you would use to do a plaque assay, the cells will form uh, colonies. They will grow, whereas a non-transformed cell will not do that. And they also don't need as much growth factor in the medium. They need less serum. And you will understand this in a bit when you see, uh, in the case of Rouse and other viruses, why the cells are transformed. So those are the properties of transformed cells. Now I want you to remember that transformation and oncogenesis are really distinct things. Okay. Transformation occurs in cells in culture. It's what happens when you put a virus or some other kind of insult onto a cell that changes their properties in the ways we've just described. Just really nice, is any of this being used for other things like this? Not that I know of, but you could ask Dixon de Pommier okay. when he comes here at the end. When you find out how this works, maybe you won't want to know the answer. <laughs> All right, so transformation is in cells and culture. Oncogenesis is a development of a tumor. 
This happens in an animal and requires other changes. So the virus makes the first change that transforms cells. In order for those cells to form a tumor, they need five or six or seven other genetic changes that occur after the cells keep growing and growing unchecked. They accumulate mutations and eventually you get six or seven in very specific places, then you have a tumor. So a transformed cell need not be oncogenic. But when we study these cells, they provide insight into what gives us oncogenic potential, the first step towards oncogenesis, which is transformation. No virus can do it all. So when a virus causes cancer, it just begins the process. It doesn't do the rest, which is what the cell does. And I think you, that's what I want you to come away with today. So how can a viral infection do this? Uh, to, do, to transform a cell, first of all, you have to reduce cytopathic effects or get rid of them. Remember, a lot of viruses are cytopathic. We don't want the cells to die, otherwise it can't be transformed because a transformed cell is immortal. We have to reduce viral replication or eliminate it completely. Transformed cells typically do not produce virions. And the cell has to divide still to make a focus, a transformed focus. So all of these events must occur. Now, the first two conditions you should ring a bell because they are two of the characteristics of a persistent infection. Go back to the first two. Cytopathic effects must be reduced or eliminated. Viral replication must be reduced or eliminated. That's one of, those are two of the things you need to have persistent infection. So that's why we say transformation is a form of persistent infection. So in the, in the transformed cell, what happens to the viral genome? In some cases, they're all or parts of the genome integrated into the host genome. Sometimes there's no viral nucleic acid in the cell whatsoever. And these were very early observations, and these didn't make any sense because people thought, well, how could it be that the genome sometimes is there and sometimes it's not? We can't make any sense of this. But you'll see how that ex is explained in a, in a few moments. So it, the transforming infection is not a latent infection. Remember, a latent infection is one where the virus infects. You make some virions, then no virions are present. Then later on, at some insult, they make more virions. Then they turn it off. So the whole genome is there, so it can make virions, like herpes simplex type 1. But this is not the case with this, because they typically don't have, make virus, and they don't even have the complete genome, so they can't make virus. So what's going on here? This is what we're going to talk about now for the next 15 minutes or so. I want to explain that to you. And this whole route of understanding how viruses transform cells uh, took a long time, starting from the 1909 experiment that we talked about with retroviruses. And we'll talk about the studies through the 50s. There was also at the same time in vitro cancer biology studies, people were trying to understand how cancer arose. And then beginning in the 1920s, the studies on transforming DNA viruses. And at one point, all these converged in the 60s and 70s to give us our present theory of not only transformation, but growth control. All of these studies make it, made it really clear to us how growth in cells is controlled. So let's start here with uh, Rouse sarcoma virus. How does it cause tumors in chickens? And how does it transform cells according to Howard Temin's experiment? This took over 60 years to sort this out. So here's the start, avian leukosis viruses, ALVs. These are the retroviruses from, related to the ones that Rouse found. These are endemic in all chicken flocks throughout the world, no exception. Um, these were first isolated in 1908. These are not transforming viruses. These are just viruses that infect chicken. They happen to be retroviruses. They're simple retroviruses. They have reverse transcriptase. They integrate their DNA into the host cell. You know all of this, but what you don't know is that most chickens are infected with this virus within a few months of hatching. And uh, this, the disease that results, called leukosis or leukemia, that's where the name comes from, leukosis, another name for leukemia, occurs sporadically in infected birds once they are older than 14 weeks. It's about 3% incidence in a flock, they get leukemia. Uh, the other 97% of the birds, they make a little virus, they have an immune response, they clear the virus, and that's the end of that. So this is a very slow disease to develop. It's not an acute disease, and it is not a solid tumor. Leukemia is, of course, a tumor of 
white blood cells, but it doesn't form a solid tumor like the sarcoma that Rouse cut off of his chicken and ground up for his 1909 experiments. Okay? So avian leukosis viruses infect all chickens, and this is, the, this is the pathology or the pathogenesis. Now, as these birds age, if you live on a farm with lots of birds, you will see other rare cancers occur. You have enough birds, you're going to see these rare cancers, and they're often tumors of connective tissue, which is a sarcoma. And of course, that's what Rouse studied, Rouse sarcoma virus. These are solid tumors. So what's the relationship? If you isolate virus from these solid tumors and re-inject them into chicken, they cause solid tumors. They don't cause leukemias in chicken. And when they do cause these solid tumors, they do so rapidly. And that's the virus that Rouse isolated, Rouse sarcoma virus. It, he got it from a solid tumor, so one of these rare solid tumors that arose in a farm in New Jersey. And he injected it, and the tumor developed very rapidly in the recipient. His virus grew quite well. When other people subsequently tried to reproduce his findings, um, they found that most of the viruses in these tumors were defective. They couldn't replicate on their own. They needed to have the original ALV, avian leukosis virus, present as a helper virus. And you'll see why in a moment. Okay, so Rouse was very lucky. He isolated a non-defective virus from this chicken. But most of the other ones subsequently isolated are defective. Which, all, which simply means that in order for it to grow, if you just inject those into a, a chicken, they will not cause a tumor unless you put with them the original avian leukosis virus. So what does all this mean? What's the relationship of Rouse to ALV? And as, you, as I've said, Peyton Rouse was very lucky. But in science, that's often what happens. You get lucky. And if you quit, you're not going to get lucky. So you have to spend enough time on something to get lucky. OK, so remember retrovirus life cycle. ALV is a simple retrovirus. Uh, the, the RNA is copied into DNA. It integrates in the host cell. The cell makes mRNAs, which then are translated to make new virion particles. So this is all you know. Now, why does Rouse, but not ALV, cause sarcomas? The key finding was that the viral genomes from the solid tumors that Rouse originally studied are recombinants. A piece of the ALV genome is replaced with a piece of host DNA. This we didn't find out until 60 years later. So we're fast forwarding here. The DNA that is in the virus is not random. It's not just any piece of DNA. But it encodes what we now call an oncogene. And this was identified by Michael Bishop and Harold Varmus. They identified the oncogene in Rouse sarcoma virus in 1976. So the original virus that Rouse had isolated, they found in it a gene from chicken cells, and they called that SARC, sarcoma virus, SARC. And they both got the Nobel Prize in 1989 for this. And that's the first Nobel Prize after Rouse to come out of this. And I don't know if I have the other one on this slide, but Howard Temin, of course, who originally found out that you could transform cells in culture with Rouse sarcoma virus, subsequently discovered reverse transcriptase along with David Baltimore. And they both got the Nobel Prize for that. So two, two Nobel Prizes after Rouse uh, on this virus. So here's the major insight that clarified everything. So ALV infected birds, as I said, come down with a variety of tumors. Remember, there's a transient viremia. Some of them get leukemia, 3%. And then as they age, the others that cleared the virus develop tumors. They cleared the virus, but remember, they have proviral DNA in them. Right? The retrovirus is never gone. These rare tumors all contain different, they're all defective, and they're all different. Rouse's was the only non-defective one. He was very lucky. I'll show you a picture of this, which will make it clearer. So the retroviral genomes, which you can isolate from a, each tumor, so you get different chickens from different flocks with tumors, solid tumors, you isolate retroviruses. They're all derived from ALV, but they're all different because they've picked up different genes. Rouse's virus picked up the SARC gene, but every other virus that you pull out of a sarcoma picks up a different gene. And so we identified many, many different oncogenes in cells by studying these different uh, bird isolates, a gold mine for molecular oncology. So here are some of these uh, viruses, proviral DNA sequences. Here on the left are, are our avian retroviruses. So here's 
the original virus, avian leukosis virus. It's a non-defective virus that infects all chickens in the world at birth. Rouse from a solid tumor isolated this virus right here, Rouse sarcoma virus. You see it has the SARC gene inserted into it, but the rest of the genome is still fine. It, doesn't, it didn't lose any viral genes to acquire this SARC gene, so it's non-defective. So he was really lucky because everyone else after him who isolated a virus from a chicken sarcoma isolated defective viruses, which are all listed below here. And each of these have picked up a different oncogene from the host cell. And you can see they have these three letter names, FIPS, MIB, ETS, MIC, uh, YES, JUN, HERB, REL, etc. And they're all cellular genes that have been picked up by these viruses. And as a consequence, they can transform host cells. How that happens, we'll talk about. But they've all, these viruses have all lost viral sequence in the process of getting these cellular oncogenes. That's really important. So they can't replicate on their own. They are defective. To get these viruses to replicate, you have to mix them with ALV and infect the cell. And then they will replicate. So that's why we call these defective. So you see how lucky Rouse was, that he got one at the very start that was non-defective, because if he didn't get this, he would not see anything, and he would have stopped, most likely. We also have uh, transducing retroviruses isolated from mammalian species here. These are all uh, isolated from uh, mice and, and primates of different sorts. So for example, the progenitor is murine leukemia virus, a virus found in most mouse strains which is non-defective, it replicates in mice, causes a leukemia, but you can isolate from mice with various tumors, defective versions that have picked up, again, oncogenes from the mouse cell, ABL, MOS, RAF, FES, FIMS, etc. Here's a sarcoma virus from, sim from monkeys uh, transforming, here's one from cats, okay, so different species can do this. So that's what these viruses have done, they picked up uh, cellular sequences, and that, that is what make them transform. Now, don't get the impression that all retroviruses can transform cells. Uh, for example, the lentiviruses that we talked about last time, these are cytopathic. They kill cells. They cannot transform them because they kill them. But the viruses we've talked about, Rouse, ALS, and the, and the mouse leukemia viruses, they do not kill cells, so they have the potential to transform them. The other thing which to clarify for you if, you, if you don't understand, the idea of defective versus non-defective retroviruses. One more time, a defective virus is missing some part of the genome, so it needs a helper to produce that part in order to produce more virus. And typically, these viruses are missing envelope uh, glycoproteins, and these get deleted during the process of oncogene capture, and that's why they're defective. Now, this slide shows you two mechanisms for the capture of oncogenes by viruses. I, I don't need, want you to um, learn this. It is just to show you, because I'm sure you're thinking, how does a virus capture an oncogene? We don't really understand, but there, there are two hypotheses shown here. And uh, since the, neither have been proven, there's no need for you to understand. But basically, you remember that uh, viral DNA integrates into the DNA of the host cell. And it does so almost randomly, and at some point it's going to integrate next to an oncogene. Now an oncogene, as we will learn shortly, is a gene with various functions in the cell that can kick that cell to, to divide uncontrollably under certain conditions. And when I explain to you what these oncogenes are, you'll understand that. But randomly, an, a, a retrovirus integrate next to one of these oncogenes. Uh, and then when the viral RNA is produced, Sometimes it's just plain old vir wild type viral RNA, but rarely uh, the polymerase may transcribe the, the downstream oncogene, which is what you see here. This will then get packaged into the virus particle. So now you have one RNA with a little bit of oncogene fused to the virus RNA in one wild type. And then uh, during infection of the new cell, what we think is that there's some recombination events that occur, which eventually make the, the virus that, that comes out have a, a copy of uh, both copies of uh, our, the provirus that integrates is now uh, bringing in the, the cellular oncogene. Okay, so starting from this original integration event, you have produ production of new virus particles that carry an oncogene, and then infection of a new cell, that oncogene is transmitted. Now, sometimes what happens is additional 
mutations or, or changes occur in this oncogene. And, and for some of the retroviruses, this is very important. So you can see this light colored sequence here on the bottom means that the original oncogene has changed in some way. So in some, in many, yes. Um, it is not, it does not happen all the time. It's a relatively rare event, which is why transformation, it's a, the, ori the, ori the generation of the original transforming virus is a rare event. And that probably reflects that this read through doesn't occur all the time. And cause, because the LTR of the virus has transcriptional stop sequences that should stop it. But sometimes a mistake is made. But the selection for the oncogene is so powerful that is, it transforms cells and initiates tumor formation that it's very easy to see. So these viral oncogenes that are picked up, the ones that we've talked about so far, Rouse derived, are not precise copies. They're either mutated or overexpressed forms of the normal cellular genes. Because that gene is in the cell. If it's there, why doesn't it transform the cell? Well, because the, vi the virus takes it out, it either mutates it or overexpresses it. And that is what, that's, that's when the problems arise. These oncogenes are normal cellular genes that are involved in cellular growth regulation. And the cell genes are often called proto-oncogenes. These are, these are genes that control the cell cycle. And in fact, they were discovered by virtue of being oncogenes. We learned about all aspects of control of cell growth by studying these oncogenes picked up by retroviruses. So oncogenes in the virus now are mutant proto-oncogene. The proto-oncogene is what is in the cell. The retrovirus picks it up and now becomes a oncogene. So basically, if a proto-oncogene is either expressed at the wrong time or if they are mutated so that they are on or off, the cell grows without regulation. So now the virus has taken a, cell, a normal cell gene, has either mutated it or is expressing it at the wrong time and that is what causes cellular transformation. Proto-oncogenes, of course, this is what's in the cell. And this is what was hypothesized years ago by many cancer biologists. They said there's some cell gene that's gone wrong, but they didn't have any evidence for it. And viruses gave them that evidence. So proto-oncogenes are found in all cell and they're con involved in the control of cell growth. They are highly regulated because you, you want to regulate cell growth. There are over 60 of them now known. And they have these three letter names, as we said. And the, the cellular genes have a C in front of them. The normal cellular counterparts, C onx, so C mix, C mos, C ras. So the ras uh, or the SARC protein would have a C in front of it. And then the, the retroviruses that carry the altered copies, you put a V in front of it. V mic, V mos, V ras, V SARC. So that SARC gene identified by Bishop and Varmus in the virus has a normal cellular counterpart. There are five major classes of proto-oncogenes. Again, these are the normal cell genes that have been picked up and sent wrong by the retroviruses. One is, is those encoding extracellular growth factors. So these are growth factors that the cell normally needs to tell it when to divide. Then, of course, growth factors work via receptors the growth factor binds a receptor and initiates signaling cascades which stimulate cell growth. There are intracellular signal transducers. These transmit the signal started by the growth factor receptor and uh, transmit the signal into the nucleus to kick cell division. How do they work? They w interact with nuclear transcription proteins that regulate expression of genes that are needed for cell division. And finally, there are tumor suppressor genes. These are genes that are negative regulators of cell growth. Now, these are not picked up by retroviruses. These were identified in the DNA tumor viruses, which we will see. So these four classes were picked up in retroviruses. So this defines a signaling cascade from the growth, from the growth um, factor in the medium all the way down into the nucleus to stimulating cell growth. So here's a diagram of how this works. So here are all the, so you basically can make an oncogene 
out of any of these components of this signaling pathway. So growth factors, we know of oncogenes that are growth factors. The receptors for these growth factors, we know a number which are also oncogenes. They've been picked up by retroviruses and can transform cells. Membrane-bound protein kinases, G proteins, such as RAS, cytoplasmic protein kinases, and finally, transcriptional regulators in the nucleus. So again, this is a pathway that tells the cell to divide. There's a growth factor present, it binds a receptor, and it starts this signaling cascade, the cell eventually divides. And this, is, this cascade is divided into discrete steps. There are proteins at every step that have a function, and retroviruses can pick up any of these genes and alter them in a certain way such that they're always active. And when they're reintroduced into the cell by the retrovirus, the cell divides uncontrollably. So for example, you don't have growth factors around all the time, but with a mutant growth factor brought in by a retrovirus, you do. You now have a growth factor present all the time, and it's making the cells divide. So that's what transforms the cells. Uncontrolled cell growth, cell shape change, loss of adhesion is by a retrovirus bringing into a cell an altered form or an overexpressed form of one of these critical proteins, oncoproteins. So again, this, these whole pathways were really sorted out by using these genes discovered in transforming retroviruses. So in the cell, these genes are under strict control, as you might imagine, because the cell should not be dividing all the time. Most of our cells, in fact, are not. Only under certain conditions should they divide. And they can be activated such that they're out of control by several ways. Um, you can have mutations in the gene encoding the growth factor or the receptor or whatever the signaling protein is. Uh, you can have loss of expression regulation. So in a, in a retrovirus, maybe a protein, the gene encoding a protein is next to a promoter that is very strong and is on all the time. Whereas normally in the cell, the promoter would be regulated. So the, it's no longer regulated when it's brought in uh, by a retrovirus. So these are dominant ways of f messing up the regulation of these oncogenes. There are also negative or recessive regulators, and these are mutations in tumor suppressor genes. Okay, so normally these genes block the formation uh, or block the progression of cell division. They negatively regulate cell division. Well, everything we've talked about up here, the growth factor pathways positively regulate gro growth. They push cells to grow. The tumor suppressor genes negatively regulate cell growth. They focus on cell growth. And mutations in those genes will now allow cells to multiply uncontrollably. And I said, I said these were discovered with the DNA viruses. Okay. So to, to understand how this works, we need to remember the cell cycle that cells undergo. Uh, and there are key control points. So there are, for example, the proto-oncogenes that we've talked about act at G0. The, they push cells into the rest of the cycle. They push cells through mitosis, through growth phases, through DNA synthesis phases, and eventually back uh, through cell division. There are checkpoints here that the tumor suppressor genes engage. So here, if conditions aren't right in the cell, if there is DNA damage or if there's a viral DNA in the cell, these tumor suppressor genes will stop cell division as a kind of defense. And if you have mutations in these tumor suppressor genes, you don't have that functionality any longer and the cells will go through the stop checkpoint. So again, these, were, these tumor suppressor genes, these negative regulators were revealed in the DNA viruses and the retroviruses revealed these dominant oncogenes that push the cells through the growth cycle. <clears throat> now retroviruses, remember the ones that uh, put in a positively acting uh, oncogene, do, they transform cells in three ways. One involves rapid tumor formation, and this is like Rouse sarcoma virus, typically two weeks or so. Rouse carries an activated oncogene has a mutation in it that makes the protein constitutively active. It's not regulated anymore. It's a dominant oncogene. When the virus comes in the cell, this protein is produced, the cells start to multiply uncontrollably. They cannot be checked because of this mutant growth factor. So that's one. Then there's intermediate kinetics of tumor formation. 
that is avian leukosis virus. Remember, some of the chickens, many months after being infected, they develop tumors. This virus doesn't have a dominant vionc. Uh, what happens with these ALVs to cause these sporadic tumors is that they integrate next to an oncogene and turn on its uncontrolled expression. So they don't capture it, they integrate next to it in the genome and turn it on when it shouldn't be. Okay? So that's a cis activation mechanism. And finally, you have slow kinetics of tumor formation. This is typical for HTLV, human T cell leukemia virus. Years, it takes years to get tumors formed. HTLV, like ALV, carries no dominant oncogene, but it also does not integrate into oncogenes in our genome. But rather, it makes a protein that is a transcriptional activator that then goes in the cell and activates the production of growth factors that push the cell to divide uncontrollably, okay? So three mechanisms. You inappropriately express a growth control protein. You integrate next to a growth control protein resulting in its inappropriate expression. Or you make a protein that makes transcripts of that growth control protein. And so we have, based on those three, we have three kinds of transforming retroviruses. We have trans, what we call transducing retroviruses. These pick up a normal cellular gene by that mechanism I showed you before. And they either make mutations in it or fuse it to viral gene. They make an altered protein with abnormal properties. So this is like Rouse. Then we have cis-acting retroviruses. They integrate next to an oncogene. So uh, the downstream LTR, the one on the right of the genome, has, has a powerful promoter in it and also has enhancers. This integrates next to some cellular gene. If it happens to be an oncogene involved in growth control, that integration turns on the expression of that oncogene uncontrollably. And then finally, we have the transactivating retroviruses, slow inducers of tumors. They express a transcriptional activator protein like HTLV1, and they turn on cellular growth genes. So they stimulate the production of proteins that shouldn't be produced. They stimulate cell division. So three distinct mechanisms and three kinds of retroviruses. So here are some, some diagrams of these. It's the same thing that I've just told you on the last two slides. It's shown as a picture. Three different kinds of, of retroviruses. The first is transducing. Here the virus has picked up from the cell in the previous growth cycle an oncogene. In this case, it is integrated into the host genome. It produces this oncogene, which then pushes the cell to divide uncontrollably. There are no controls on the production of this oncogene, as there are on the normal cellular version, or there are mutations in it that make it constitutively active. We have the cis-activating retroviruses. They integrate next to an oncogene, and transcription initiated at the LTR produces inappropriately the oncoprotein. And finally, the transactivating retroviruses, they integrate, they produce viral transactivators that activate the transcription of, of cellular genes, okay? So those are the three mechanisms of, by which retroviruses transform cells. What you should also remember is that these viruses trans transform cells as a mistake. They don't have to do this they pick up genes or they insert next to genes by accident. That's not a part of their life cycle. They don't need to pick up an oncogene in order to replicate. There is no obvious requirement for transformation or oncogenesis for the survival of retroviruses or their evolution. Okay, so just really remember that. It's, an, it's a mistake, it's an accident that retroviruses transform cells. It's not part of their uh, life cycle. Okay, let's talk about the DNA viruses now, how this uh, revealed more about cell cycle regulation. The first uh, oncogenic DNA virus discovered in 1933 by Richard Shope. These were papillomaviruses, small uh, viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes. They caused warts in cottontail rabbits. And Richard Shope also worked at the Rockefeller Institute. Ludwig Gross discovered polyomaviruses in 1953. These caused tumors in certain kinds of animals, rare tumors also. In 1962, Eddie and Hilleman showed that SV40, they actually discovered SV40 as a contaminant of the early 
polio vaccines, which were produced in monkey cells, which happened, these monkeys happened to be infected with SV40. And they showed that these viruses, these are monkey viruses, caused rare tumors in newborn hamsters. As a side, it turns out that many people got SV40 in their polio vaccines um, in the early days of immunization. But so far, there's no evidence that any tumors have resulted. So t uh, the classic DNA tumor virus is SV40, which I've just described to you. Its natural host is the monkey. It does not cause tumors in the monkey. It does not transform monkey cells. It will transform other species of cells. So really calling it a tumor virus is a bit of a stretch because in its natural host, it doesn't cause tumors. But it does cause tumors in some animals, so the name has stuck. Polyomavirus, another similar virus. This one is from mice, very similar to SV40, except from the mouse. No role in mouse cancer, but it will make tumors in different animals, hamsters, rats, and rabbits. So all of this is important, why it's not causing tumors in the original host. It will be clear in a moment. So here is what happens to cells of different species when you infect them with either SV40 or mouse polyomavirus. If you take a monkey, you infect with SV40. The monkey's permissive. It's the natural host. Mouse polyomavirus monkey cells are not permissive. Uh, if you take SV40, it does not infect mouse cells, will infect, sorry, will, no, does not infect mouse cells, will infect monkey. Sorry? Hang on, I'm just looking. All right. SV40 is the monkey virus. It will not replicate in mouse cells. Of course, it will replicate. Well, whereas polyomavirus will replicate in those cells. And hamster and rat cells are semi-permissive for both viruses, okay? All of these cells are susceptible, which means, of course, that they have receptors. And uh, permissivity, of course, means being able to make new virions. Semi-permissive means you only get early proteins made, no virions. So the, the summary here is that tumors occur only in semi-permissive species. In other words, SV40 and mouse polyam do not cause tumors in their natural hosts, only in hamsters and rats, which is not their natural host. Why is this? And this is the key. Here, here are some more observations we need to know. If you infect a 100,000 cells with SV40 or polyoma, rat or hamster, you get one transformed focus. So it's very rare. It's not a normal part of the life cycle. So what does this mean? So this is just a review of polyomas in case you have forgotten them. They're small DNA viruses, double-stranded DNA, rather short icosahedral capsids. And SV40, as I have told you, is a monkey virus. There are also human uh, viruses. One is called BK, associated with some tumors, and JC, which apparently infects most of us. And I think Saul has talked about that. Papillomaviruses are also DNA tumor viruses. Remember the, the show papillomavirus in rabbit? It's the first papillomavirus. Uh, now we have many human papillomaviruses, uh, over 100 serotypes, uh, some of which are responsible for cervical cancers and other cancers as well. A third type of DNA tumor virus is the adenovirus. These are larger double-stranded DNA viruses, bigger DNA, more proteins many human serotypes. They do not cause cancer in humans, but they can cause tumor in hamsters. So this has also been informative in understanding uh, the basis of, of tumorigenesis. And like polyoma and papillomas, these are rare events. Only one focus uh, when you add a lot of virus to cells. Okay, so those are the three kinds of DNA tumor viruses we're going to talk about now to summarize what we've learned about growth control. So viruses from these families cause rare tumors and rare transforming events in certain cell types. And a key discovery was the finding of tumor antigens. So when animals are infected by these tumor viruses, they make proteins in the tumor tissue. And these antibodies were used to define what kinds of proteins are present. And in cells, when you transform cells with these viruses, they make the same protein. So they were called T antigens or tumor antigens. And you've heard these before in the context of DNA replication. When you transform cells with these DNA viruses and look for viral DNA, what you find is that most of the viral DNA is not present. 
all that you can find in many cases is DNA encoding the T antigen, these proteins originally described as present in tumors and transformed cells. So this is very different from transformation by retroviruses where a lot of the genome is still present. So these are the T antigens between the SV40 polyomas and papillomaviruses. So you've heard about some of these before. SV40 polyoma, there are a couple of different sizes. There's large and small T, large, middle, and small T. Uh, and they're all, SV40 and mouse versions are all different. Okay, so SV40 has its own set of T antigens and polyoma has its own set. For the papillomaviruses, they have three. They're, they're encoded by E5, E6, and E7 genes. They're all early proteins. Adenovirus also has T antigens. They're called E1A and E1B. All different. Papilloma, adenovirus, all different proteins. But they all have the same function, as you will see, or similar functions in, in regulating cell growth. Now, these are essential viral genes. They're absolutely required for replication, and they also activate transcription. This was discussed in two previous lectures. They're needed for viral DNA synthesis. And again, they are the only viral genes that are always present in tumor cells, either in an animal or in a transformed cell in a culture. So the genes for the T antigen are the only ones that are consistently present. So why are they there? Are they the cause of transformation or the effect of it? Two key observations that led to the answering this question. First of all, T antigen is essential for DNA replication. You learned that already. And T antigen alone can transform cells. In fact, we use T antigen in the lab. If we want to immortalize cells from an animal, we put T antigen in them. And it can come from any of these viruses. And those cells will, will divide forever and become immortalized. So T antigen is enough. Now remember, SV40 doesn't encode a DNA polymerase. It depends on the host cell DNA polymerase in order to replicate. If you remember, T antigen recruits the polymerase to the origin. In addition, T SV40 wants the cells to be dividing to be able to replicate in it uh, so that uh, it, it moves the cells into the G1 and S phases. It wants actively replicating DNA so that it can use the polymerase. So, in addition, a number of years later, it was found that a cell protein of about 53 kilodaltons bound to SV40T antigen, this is called P53, that's fact number one. Fact two, transcription of adenovirus early genes, which includes the T antigens of adenovirus, requires a cell protein called E2F. These are transcription proteins, they're now called the E2F family of transcription proteins. So these are required for early adenovirus uh, mRNA synthesis. And finally, fact three, E2F, one of the transcri cellular transcription proteins, was found to be bound to another cell protein called the retinoblastoma protein, or RB. So retinoblastoma protein was originally identified in eye tumors in children. It turns out that these three proteins, P53, RB, and E2F are critical players in regulating the cell cycle. Now remember the growth factors and the, the proteins in the growth factor pathway that are picked up by retroviruses are crucial for pushing the cell into division. These regulate the cell cycle, whether or not they're gonna, the cells will respond to those growth factors. Okay, again, we look at the cell cycle here. Uh, the beginning, mitosis is at the top here, of course. We have cell growth, replication of DNA, and then cell division, okay? So this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about retroviral picked up proteins that send signals for this cycle to begin, and then regulatory proteins that decide whether to accept those signals or not. So here's the link between all of these. RB and P53 are negative regulators. Those are the ones I told you about at the very beginning. They stop cells from cycling when the conditions are not right. They're the brakes for the cell cycle engine. So the, onco the activated oncogenes from the retrovirus, identified in retroviruses, say to the cell cycle, let's go. And RB and P53 say, wait, let's make sure that conditions are right. 
is everything okay? Can we do this? And if it's not right, they put a break on what, it, what the signals that the growth factors have sent in. That's why they're called tumor suppressor genes. So I think you can begin to see now why mutations in these genes would also cause uh, transformation as well. So a, no, a go, no-go decision to turn on the cell cycle is determined by growth factors in the medium, basically. Is the outside world rich enough to replicate the cell? And those growth factors in the medium, they're all encoded by oncogenes that were picked up by retroviruses. That's how they were identified. And the whole pathway leading from the growth factor all the way into the nucleus, all the steps were oncogenes identified in retroviruses. Now, if conditions are not right, these RB and P53 proteins pause the cell cycle at the restriction point. The cell doesn't make DNA and does not divide. So let's go back to the cell cycle picture. Here's the restriction point in G1. So this, there may be signals for this cycle to begin, to cells to enter G1, but if P53 and RB figure that conditions aren't right, they will stop the cell cycle right here. They will not, not allow DNA to replicate, and cells will not divide until conditions are right. And the protein that regulates, one of the proteins that regulates this is RB. And as I said, this was identified in uh, children with retinal tumors. This is a recessive oncogene. These kids have to have mutations in both copies of the RB gene in order to get a retinal tumor. And this was sorted out many years ago. So let's look at a, a simple mitogenetic activation of cell cycle progression. So these many of these components are oncogenes that were identified in transforming retroviruses. So you have, this is a cell here, the plasma membrane, the nucleus is down here. And here is a growth factor receptor. So you have growth, if you add growth factors to the medium, uh, these are the ligands here in yellow, it will bind the receptor. You then start a phosphorylation cascade through RAS proteins and a number of kinases, all of which end up raising the level of cyclins in the nucleus. The cyclins phosphorylate RB protein, or lead to the phosphorylation of RB protein, and that blocks its negative regulation of the cell cycle. The cells can now go uh, from G1 into S. All right, so here you have, you add growth factors. The transduction cascade goes, ends up in the nucleus. Uh, RB is phosphorylated. Growth can begin. Now, how does that work? How does RB control growth? RB, as I told you before, binds the E2F family of proteins. The E2F family are transcription proteins that in turn are needed for the production of mRNAs that encode proteins needed to go through the cell cycle. Okay, so these are, some of these E2F dependent genes are absolutely required to start S phase. So RB is usually bound to these proteins which blocks them from activating. So RB is negatively regulating the ability to start S phase of the cell cycle. When you phosphorylate RB by these cell cyclin dependent kinases, which we showed in the previous slide, these guys down here in the nucleus, these phosphorylate RB. When RB is phosphorylated, it gets released from the E2F proteins and then E2F can go to their target genes, make the mRNAs, and then the cell can leave G1 and move into S. So that's how, in a simple way, how RB controls the cell cycle. If it's phosphorylated, that means that conditions are right, there are growth factors present, and that the cell can divide. But if there aren't any growth factors present, for example, RB will not be phosphorylated, it will stay bound to these E2F proteins, and you will not get entry uh, of the cell into S. Now, of course, DNA viruses want the cell to be in S phase right? Because they need, especially those small DNA viruses, they need the cell to be actively making DNA so that it can use the DNA polymerase. And that's where T antigen comes into effect. T antigen by itself kicks cells into S phase. T antigens bind RB, that releases E2F proteins and initiates S transcription. So the normal pathway in the cell is to phosphorylate RB and dissociate it from E2F. What the T antigens do is to, to bind 
RB and take it away from E2F. They want to do this because they want the cell to be actively dividing. They don't want to transform the cell. That's an accident, too. They want the cell to divide. So they sequester RB so that the cell can kick into uh, S phase. <clears throat> so this is a schematic of how this works. So normally, uh, RB is bound. Here's RB, this yellow guy here, is bound to uh, the E2F family of proteins, and that blocks them from acting. If you phosphorylate RB, you dissociate it from E2F. So E2F is the pink guy here. It's a complex of other proteins as well. But the point is phosphorylation of RB separates it so that now uh, E2F can go on to its target genes and initiate DNA synthesis. If you introduce T antigens to this equation, E1A, L, large T, or E7, the T antigens from three different kinds of DNA transforming viruses, those T antigens will bind RB. So the, the effect is the same as to phosphorylate it. It releases E2F, so E2F can now go on to its target genes. So remember, it's a transcription factor, and those gene products are then needed to kick the cell into S phase. So the viruses want to do this, again, to have DNA polymerase, actively dividing cells. So the T antigens bypass normal cell regulatory control of RB phosphorylation. The viruses want to do this so they can replicate. They're not meaning to transform the cell. There is another step of control here, whether to go through the cell cycle into S, and that is uh, regulated by P53, the other protein that binds T antigens. If there is DNA damage in the cell or unscheduled DNA synthesis, like viral DNA synthesis, P53 can detect this in ways we don't have time to get into. But if P53 detects one of these two conditions, it says we are not going into S. And there's a whole other mechanism for that that we won't go into. But just like RB can block cells from going into S, P53 can also. It just has different uh, inputs. P53 is looking at DNA damage or viral DNA synthesis. So P53, as I said, recognizes DNA damage. It recognizes viral DNAs as abnormal. Cell DNAs are fine, but it sees viral DNA replication. It says this is not a good idea. If E2F happens to be free, remember that can happen if either RB is phosphorylated or bound by T antigens, then E2F plus P53 induce apoptosis. This is how P53 is putting the brakes on the cells, or one of the ways. It induces apoptosis because it's got free RB, uh, free E2F essentially, and the cells die. And remember, a lot of DNA viruses do what to apoptosis? They block it, right? This is why, because P53 is messing it with it and pushing the cells into apoptosis. So the DNA virus says, no, no, we need to replicate in these cells so they inhibit apoptosis. So that, that is the link between these two aspects of infection. Infected cells enter S phase because T antigen counter the RB checkpoint. And infected cells don't die because P53 is inactivated by T antigens. Okay? So that's what the T antigens do. They counter RB and they counter P53, which are both gatekeepers of the cell cycle. They want the cell to go into S so they can have good DNA replication conditions. Two more mysteries. So why are all the viral genes except the T antigens deleted or turned off? And why is transformation so inefficient? Well, transformation is rare because you need two low probability events to occur. First of all, you can't express the lethal late genes of these viruses. Uh, all the genes that make capsids and cause the cells to, to lice. So you either have to have a deletion of late genes or the virus infects semi-permissive cells where late gene expression is blocked. So now you remember, these viruses only transform cells that are semi-permissive, the wrong species. And this is why they're able to transform them, because they don't go into late viral, DNA, uh, late viral gene expression. 
So the cells are not killed and they can instead be transformed. In addition, they have to give T antigen to every cell that, that is produced from the original one. So the DNA encoding T antigen has to be integrated into the host DNA. So this is also a rare event, the integration of T antigen, because that has to be inherited by all the subsequent cells, because if they don't have T antigen, what is going to happen? RB and P53 are going to be active again, and they're going to stop unscheduled entry into S. Okay? So that's why transformation is rare. Uh, you can't have lytic replication, so you have to transform only non-permissive cells. You have to prevent uh, late gene expression and you have to have T antigen in every cell, which means it has to integrate, which is also a rare event. So again, just like transformation by the retroviruses, transformation and tumor formation are, are And that's why I say DNA tumor virus is a stretch, because in their normal hosts, they don't cause tumors. They cause tumors in, their, in, in, their, in what are not their natural hosts, because of the aberrant conditions that arise, semi-permissive replication and the rare integration of T antigen coding sequences into the genome. None of that is needed for the normal life cycle. And all you need to do is look at a permissive cell where these viruses replicate quite well. They are lytic. They don't cause tumors. They don't transform cells. This is an accident. Yet, it's been, for us, it's been an informative accident. And I think this is one of the beauties of science where you take an accident, a virus transforming the wrong cell, and you pursue it. You know, can you imagine, just think if you said, well, I'm going to study rare transformation of hamster cells with a human virus that doesn't cause tumors in humans. Just think how someone would react to that if they didn't really understand what was going on. You have to be very persistent. Yet that kind of study led us to understand how transformation occurs. So sometimes you have to pursue what seem like odd things in order to understand uh, what's going on. But if you remember one thing today, just remember that the transformation of cells by either retroviruses or these DNA viruses is not part of the normal life cycle. It is an accident. But for us, as I said, it's been a beneficial accident. Another way to look at it is that transformation is an epiphenomena of a unique life cycle. As I've ta said many times, the DNA viruses have to interfere with the cell cycle. They have to kick the cell into S so that they make DNA. And probably all DNA viruses do this except pox viruses. Do you know why pox viruses might be the exception? I don't think we've talked about that actually here, but they use their own. They encode their own polymers. They don't care what the cell is doing. And there are also uh, very big viruses, the Mimi viruses now, which have been recently discovered. I should probably ask, add this to this slide. They also encode their own DNA synthetic machinery, so they don't have to do that. They have to start the cell synthetic machinery needed to make DNA. And just to review, T antigens turn on the cell cycle by inactivating P53, and RB. Now, the retroviruses, remember, turn on the cell cycle by mimicking the growth factor stimulatory pathway. And, and then RB and P53 don't seem to sense that anything is wrong. There's no unscheduled DNA synthesis there because it's a retrovirus. But in the case of these DNA viruses, they're acting right at the cell cycle checkpoints, P53 and RB. Remember, these are negative regulators which mean they're breaks. If you break the breaks, which is what the DNA tumor viruses do, then the cells replicate uncontrollably. And as we said, um, if the cells initiate apoptosis, P53 binding to E2F, the viral genomes have encoded ways to get around that. And it, they don't want to do this to transform cells. They want to do it to replicate their genomes. So all of this leads to transformation of cells. But remember, a transformed cell is not a tumor cell. You need more mutations in that genome of that cell to make it a tumor cell. And as I've said, if there is one mutation here, say in a growth factor that leads to retroviral transformation, you typically need five or six or seven more before that cell will become a tumor cell. Those mutations accumulate by virtue of, of the cell replicating uncontrollably. The virus now 
has nothing to do with it any longer. It's stimulated the cell to divide. Now the cell is sort of um, in a charge of itself and mutations are accumulating and when the right ones occur in the right genes, then the cell becomes a tumor cell. So in the early stages of a tumor inside of us, initially it's a transformed cell that has altered growth properties. And probably many of those never develop beyond that. But if they keep multiplying and they're not cleared and they accumulate mutations, they will eventually grow uncontrollably, metastasize, be able to direct blood flow to the tumor. All these properties are caused by other mutations. The virus is just starting. They are on their way to becoming cancer cells. So I want you to also remember that. A transformed cell is not cancer cell. The virus just initiates this.